Mr. Gagliotti, welcome to our programme. Pleasure. Um, looking at uh, negotiations that have started, uh, there seem to be some grounds for cautious optimism. Do you expect any results somewhere soon? I think we are likely to see some kind of a deal beginning to emerge. I wouldn't say necessarily soon. I think, we, unfortunately, we still have at least a couple of weeks of the current conflict to go, not least because the Russians are escalating their fighting, in part because they want to be in a better position with which to negotiate, and likewise, the Ukrainians want to give them as bloody nose as possible. Yeah, war rages on at this moment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the, what is clear is that the Russians are trying to regroup. They're desperately trying to take not just the city of Mariupol on the, in the south, but also Sumy in the north. Again, these are cities that are, if nothing else, going to be bargaining chips in any peace. No. In the meantime, uh, President Biden has called Putin a war criminal. Is that helpful in your view? It's entirely understandable, but no, I don't think it's particularly helpful. It little reminds me of the time when he notoriously called Putin a killer. These may be true in their assessments, but again, they don't bring us any closer to peace. No. Let's talk about China for a while. Um, it has kept a distance, this country, uh, up till now. Now they want to focus on diplomacy, just like the US. There has been some criticism from China on the US as well. Are we waiting for China to play a decisive role in this conflict? This is going to be one of the interesting things to watch, because it's clear that on the one hand, the Russians would like to see the Chinese support them. And yet the Chinese clearly are not going to jeopardize their trade links with the West for Russia. Remember, Beijing didn't even acknowledge the annexation of Crimea as legal. At the same time, though, there is some scope for the Chinese to step in as brokers of negotiations. It would save some of Putin's face, as he could say, it's not a Western deal, it's one settled by our allies. And from Beijing's point, it would speak to this narrative that there is a new power now in the world and it can actually make things happen. So that would be, that would be a nice perspective if China would do that. Let's, let's see um, the situation on, on the battlefield. It, it, the invasion is not going well from Putin's perspective. How do you assess the current situation on the battlefield in Ukraine? Look, it's clear that the Russians made some disastrous miscalculations right at the beginning based largely on Putin's assumption that Ukraine isn't really a country, the Ukrainians are not really a people, and the whole system would collapse at the first push. The days when they could think about trying to take the whole country are clearly over. At best, the Russians will be able to take the eastern part of Ukraine, and even that's looking quite questionable. They really are facing a, the risk of exhaustion. Now, it's still a large military, we can't write it off, but at the moment I think that what we thought was impossible, the Ukrainians actually on their own holding back the Russians, seems to be happening. Yeah, and, and what's, what's happening there? Because if you look at it, as you describe it, military strength, in terms of men, tanks, airplanes, etc., that Russia, in theory, would walk over Ukraine. Why is that not happening? This is one of the interesting uncertainties we have. The Russian military is trained to fight and equipped and armed to, in a particular way of war, which would have involved a massive preliminary bombardment of Ukraine and then a careful, methodical, coordinated assault. We haven't seen that. We saw a slightly half-hearted initial barrage. We saw this attempt to basically just send small forces of paratroopers into the cities to take them over. And we have seen a lack of coordination by the, the Russians. I think the problem is that political myopia, political assumptions about Ukraine inform the battle plan. And it's now very difficult, once you've started a war on the wrong foot, to get back onto the right foot. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that, that Putin might be regretting the invasion, despite his rhetoric? I imagine so. I mean, again, the problem we have is we don't know what Putin is told. This is clearly an increasingly out of touch leader who launched this operation based on inaccurate assumptions about Ukraine, and in particular, just how ferociously and heroically the Ukrainians would resist. 
So we don't know what his current assessments are. But I imagine that, yes, he must be, at the very least, regretting how he embarked upon it. Remember, this was a big gamble. And in some ways, this is going to define how his presidency is looked on historically. And at the moment, the answer is not well at all. No. At the same time, there, is this, there was this speech last week, this bullying speech that Putin gave about traitors and so on. What do you mm. make of that? It really was quite astonishing. And without wanting to make too much of the parallel, it was almost Stalinist in the sharp way it essentially told Russians from ordinary citizens up to oligarchs, you are either with us or you are an enemy and a traitor. And I think, again, what, what this says is two things. It tells us something about the latest evolution of Putin. We're not sure quite why. Is it age? Is it 22 years in power? Is it COVID? Is it illness? Whatever. But we clearly see someone who is much less in control these days. But secondly, again, it reflects that things are going badly. If things are going well, you don't need to threaten. You don't need to draw these lines. If, is, is there a way out for Putin? I mean, what's the most likely scenario in your view? I think the most likely scenario is that we will see some kind of peace deal, which will be enough just about to save his face at home. That probably it'll mean that, yes, Ukraine will agree that it will no longer seek to join NATO and that it will take no foreign forces on its own soil. Mm -hmm. And it will presumably hand over Crimea and the so-called People's Republic territories in the Donbass. And Putin will spin it at home. He will spin it as saying, we were never about invasion. We have gone in, we have demilitarized the U Ukrainians, we have destroyed so many tanks and planes. And now we will focus on what we always said was the mission, which is protecting the Russian speakers of eastern Ukraine from genocide. No one internationally will buy it. But it might be enough once it's spun through the state media to give him a chance to say, mission accomplished. It might be the way out. At the same time, there is an ongoing debate, Mr. Gagliotti, and it's becoming more and more urgent, and that is how to stop Putin without starting this new world war. Um, the idea is not provoking him. That's, that's uh, an idea in the West. Um, but is that enough? Or should you also consider being the West, showing your teeth? There are different ways of showing their teeth. What we have to understand is there are two wars going on at the moment. There is the kinetic war, the shooting war being fought by the Ukrainians, with obviously a lot of Western assistance, but only in the form of material and support. And then there is the non-kinetic war that is being fought by the West, economic, but also legal, cultural, and so forth. Now, that is having a massive impact. We have to understand that. But the problem with these kind of conflict is it's not quick. We live in an age where we're used to quick results to everything. And you know, the answer is actually we, we have to give it time. At the moment, I think there is no specific need to escalate. We are, in our own way, winning both the Ukrainians and the West in their respective wars. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the result is going to come quickly. No, but if this war becomes more, even more bloodier than it is right now. Is it conceivable in any way that NATO unwillingly will be forced into it? I would say unwillingly, no, but it may well feel that it has no choice. The, the kind of nightmare scenarios that we have to consider, because clearly at the moment Putin is operating outside the usual bounds of, of behavior, are that he turns to either chemical or even more terrifying nuclear forces. You know, it might be, let's say, a single tactical nuclear warhead somewhere in eastern Ukraine, sorry, in western Ukraine, hoping to bring a quick end to the war. If that happens, I think we have to appreciate that Putin has moved into a whole new stage of being a threat. And at that point, NATO will have to act in some way much more directly, because like it or not, if these red lines get crossed, then you know, it, it, is, it does become, frankly, an existential threat to us all. Yeah. But this is it. I think what we need to be doing is making it clear what the red lines are, communicating them to Putin, but also actually already knowing what we would do. Our risk is we rely on ambiguity too much. And Putin tends to assume that ambiguity means that we don't plan to do anything. So we need to know what we will do in any event. Last question, Mr. Gagliotti. Uh, 
can Russia win this war? No. Um, it can secure certain victories on the battlefield. But already, I mean, the Russian military, that Putin has spent 20 years building up, is mauled and will take years to recover. And more to the point, the Russian economy is, is going to be in crisis. It may well survive. But in some ways, what Putin has done is he has squandered all the gains of his presidency, and he's dragging Russia back to the late 1970s, which is not a good place for him to be. Thank you so much, Mark Galliotti. Thank you. A pleasure. Bedankt voor het kijken. Vond je dit een goed gesprek? Vergeet dan niet te abonneren. Een like of een reactie achterlaten kan natuurlijk ook. Of bekijk een van de andere interviews op dit kanaal.